The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 22. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 22 at the moment of marriage. The silence of the tomb lay heavy about him as Otar, Jeddak of Manator, opened his eyes in the chamber of Omai. Recollection of the frightful apparition that had confronted him swept to his consciousness. He listened, but heard not. Within the range of his vision there was nothing apparent that might cause alarm. Slowly he lifted his head and looked about. Upon the floor beside the couch lay the thing that had at first attracted his attention, and his eyes closed in terror as he recognized it for what it was. But it moved not, nor spoke. Otar opened his eyes again and rose to his feet. He was trembling in every limb. There was nothing on the dais from which he had seen the thing arise. Otar backed slowly from the room. At last he gained the outer corridor. It was empty. He did not know that it had emptied rapidly as the loud scream with which his own had mingled had broken upon the startled ears of the warriors who had been sent to spy upon him. He looked at the timepiece set in a massive bracelet upon his left forearm. The ninth zode was nearly half gone. Otar had lain for an hour unconscious. He had spent an hour in the chamber of Omai, and he was not dead. He had looked upon the face of his predecessor and was still sane. He shook himself and smiled. Rapidly he subdued his rebelliously shaking nerves so that by the time he reached the tenanted portion of the palace he had gained control of himself. He walked with chin high and something of a swagger. To the banquet hall he went, knowing that his chiefs awaited him there, and as he entered they arose and upon the faces of many were incredulity and amaze, for they had not thought to see Otar the Jeddak again after what the spies had told them of the horrid sounds issuing from the chamber of Omai. Thankful was Otar that he had gone alone to that chamber of fright, for now no one could deny the tale that he should tell. Ethos rushed forward to greet him, for Ethos had seen black looks directed toward him as the talls slipped by and his benefactor failed to return. O oh, brave and glorious Jeddak, cried the major domo, we rejoice at your safe return and beg of you the story of your adventure. It was not, exclaimed Otar. I searched the chambers carefully and waited in hiding for the return of the slave Turan, if he were temporarily away, but he came not. He is not there, and I doubt if he ever goes there. Few men would choose to remain long in such a dismal place. "'You were not attacked?' asked Ethos. "'You heard no screams nor moans?' "'I heard hideous noises and saw phantom figures, but they fled before me so that never could I lay hold of one, and I looked upon the face of Omai, and I am not mad. I even rested in the chamber beside his corpse.' In a far corner of the room a bent and wrinkled old man hid a smile behind a golden goblet of strong brew. "'Come, let us drink!' cried Otar, and reached for the dagger, the pommel of which he was accustomed to use to strike the gong which summoned slaves, but the dagger was not in its scabbard. Otar was puzzled. He knew that it had been there just before he entered the chamber of Omai for he had carefully felt all his weapons to make sure that none was missing. He seized instead a table utensil and struck the gong 
and when the slaves came bade them bring the strongest brew for otar and his chiefs before the dawn broke many were the expressions of admiration bellowed from drunken lips admiration for the courage of their jeddak but some there were who still looked glum came at last the day that otar would take the princess tara of helium to wife for hours slaves prepared the unwilling bride seven perfumed baths occupied three long and weary hours then her whole body was anointed with the oil of pimalia blossoms and massaged by the deft fingers of a slave from distant dusar her harness all new and wrought for the occasion was of the white hide of the great white apes of barsoom hung heavily with platinum and diamonds fairly encrusted with them the glossy mass of her jet hair had been built into a coiffure of stately and becoming grandeur into which diamond-headed pins were stuck until the whole scintillated as the stars in heaven upon a moonless night but it was a sullen and defiant bride that they led from the high tower toward the throne room of otar the corridors were filled with slaves and warriors and the women of the palace and the city who had been commanded to attend the ceremony all the power and pride wealth and beauty of manator were there slowly tara surrounded by a heavy guard of honor moved along the marble corridors filled with people at the entrance to the hall of chiefs ethos the major domo received her the hall was empty except for its ranks of dead chieftains upon their dead mounts through this long chamber ethos escorted her to the throne room which was also empty the marriage ceremony in manator differing from that of other countries of barsoom here the bride would await the groom at the foot of the steps leading to the throne the guests followed her in and took their places leaving the central aisle from the hall of chiefs to the throne clear for up this otar would approach his bride alone after a short solitary communion with the dead behind closed doors in the hall of chiefs it was the custom the guests had all filed through the hall of chiefs the doors at both ends had been closed presently those at the lower end of the hall opened and otar entered his black harness was ornamented with rubies and gold his face was covered by a grotesque mask of the precious metal in which two enormous rubies were set for eyes though below them were narrow slits through which the wearer could see his crown was a fillet supporting carved feathers of the same metal as the mask to the least detail his regalia was that demanded of a royal bridegroom by the customs of manator and now in accordance with that same custom he came alone to the hall of chiefs to receive the blessings and the counsel of the great ones of manator who had preceded him as the doors at the lower end of the hall closed behind him otar the jeddak stood alone with the great dead by the dictates of ages no mortal eye might look upon the scene enacted within that sacred chamber as the mighty of manator respected the traditions of manator let us too respect those traditions of a proud and sensitive people of what concern to us the happenings in that solemn chamber of the dead five minutes passed the bride stood silently at the foot of the throne the guests spoke together in low whispers until the room was filled with the hum of many voices at length the doors leading into the hall of chiefs swung open and the resplendent bridegroom stood framed for a moment in the massive opening a hush fell upon the wedding guests with measured and impressive step the groom approached the bride tara felt the muscles of her heart contract with the apprehension that had been growing upon her as the coils of fate settled more closely about her and no sign came from turan 
where was he? What, indeed, could he accomplish now to save her? Surrounded by the power of Otar, with never a friend among them, her position seemed at last without vestige of hope. I still live, she whispered inwardly, in a last brave attempt to combat the terrible hopelessness that was overwhelming her, but her fingers stole for reassurance to the slim blade that she had managed to transfer, undetected, from her old harness to the new. And now the groom was at her side, and taking her hand was leading her up the steps to the throne, before which they halted and stood facing the gathering below. Came then, from the back of the room, a procession, headed by the high dignitary, whose office it was to make these two man and wife, and directly behind him a richly clad youth, bearing a silken pillow, on which lay the golden handcuffs, connected by a short length of chain of gold, with which the ceremony would be concluded, when the dignitary clasped a handcuff about the wrist of each, symbolizing their indissoluble union in the holy bonds of wedlock. Would Turan's promised succor come too late? Tara listened to the long, monotonous intonation of the wedding service. She heard the virtues of Otar extolled and the beauties of the bride. The moment was approaching, and still no sign of Turan. But what could he accomplish should he succeed in reaching the throne room, other than to die with her? There could be no hope of rescue. The dignitary lifted the golden handcuffs from the pillow upon which they reposed. He blessed them and reached for Tara's wrist. The time had come. The thing could go no further, for alive or dead, by all the laws of Barsoom, she would be the wife of Otar of Manator the instant the two were locked together. Even should rescue come then or later, she could never dissolve those bonds, and Turan would be lost to her as surely as though death separated them. Her hand stole toward the hidden blade, but instantly the hand of the groom shot out and seized her wrist. He had guessed her intention. Through the slits in the grotesque mass she could see his eyes upon her, and she guessed the sardonic smile that the mask hid. For a tense moment the two stood thus. The people below them kept breathless silence for the play before the throne had not passed unnoticed. Dramatic as was the moment, it was suddenly rendered trebly so by the noisy opening of the doors leading to the Hall of Chiefs. All eyes turned in the direction of the interruption to see another figure framed in the massive opening, a half-clad figure buckling the half-adjusted harness hurriedly in place, the figure of Otar, Jeddak of Manator. Stop! he screamed, springing forward along the aisle toward the throne. Seize the impostor! All eyes shot to the figure of the groom before the throne. They saw him raise his hand and snatch off the golden mask, and Tara of Helium, in wide-eyed incredulity, looked up into the face of Turan the Panthon. Turan the slave! they cried then. Death to him! Death to him! Wait! shouted Turan, drawing his sword, as a dozen warriors leaped forward. Wait! screamed another voice, old and cracked, as Igos, the ancient taxidermist, sprang from around the guests and reached the throne steps ahead of the foremost warriors. At the sight of the old man the warriors paused, for age is held in great veneration among the peoples of Barsoom, as is true, perhaps, of all peoples whose religion is based to any extent upon ancestor worship. But Otar gave no heed to him, leaping instead swiftly toward the throne. Stop, coward! cried Igos. The people looked at the little old man in amazement. Men of Manator! he cackled in his thin, shrill voice. Wouldst be ruled by a coward and a liar? Down with him! 
shouted O Tar. Not until I have spoken, retorted Igos. It is my right. If I fail, my life is forfeit, that you all know and I know. I demand, therefore, to be heard. It is my right. It is his right echoed the voices of a score of warriors in various parts of the chamber. "'That Otar is a coward and a liar, I can prove,' continued Igos. "'He said that he faced bravely the horrors of the chamber of Omai, and saw nothing of a slave Turan. I was there, hiding behind the hangings, and I saw all that transpired. Turan had been hiding in the chamber, and was even then lying upon the couch of Omai when Otar, trembling with fear, entered the room. Turan, disturbed, arose to a sitting position at the same time, voicing a piercing shriek. Otar screamed and swooned. It is a lie, cried Otar. It is not a lie, and I can prove it, retorted Igos. It's noticed the night that he returned from the chambers of Omai and was boasting of his exploit, that when he would summon slaves to bring wine, he reached for his dagger to strike the gong with its pommel, as is always his custom? Didst note that, any of you, and that he had no dagger? Otar, where is the dagger that you carried into the chamber of Omai? You do not know, but I know. While you lay, in the swoon of terror I took it from your harness and hid it among the sleeping silks upon the couch of Omai. Oh there it is even now, and if any doubt it, let them go thither, and there they will find it and know the cowardice of their jeddak. But what of this impostor? demanded one. Shall he stand with impunity upon the throne of Manator whilst we squabble about our ruler? It is through his bravery that you have learned the cowardice of Otar, replied Igos, and through him you will be given a greater jeddak. We will choose our own jeddak, seize and slay the slave. There were cries of approval from all parts of the room. Gahan was listening intently, as though for some hoped-for sound. He saw the warriors approaching the dais where he now stood with drawn sword and with one arm about Tara of Helium. He wondered if his plans had miscarried after all. If they had, it would mean death for him, and he knew that Tara would take her life if he fell. Had he then served her so futilely after all his efforts? Several warriors were urging the necessity for sending at once to the chamber of Omai, to search for the dagger that would prove, if found, the cowardice of Otar. At least three consented to go. You need not fear, Igos assured them. There is naught there to harm you. I have been there often of late, and Turan the slave has slept there for these many nights. The screams and moans that frightened you and Otar were voiced by Turan to drive you away from his hiding place. Shamefacedly, the three left the apartment to search for Otar's dagger. And now the others turned their attention once more to Gahan. They approached the throne with bared swords, but they came slowly, for they had seen this slave upon the field of Jitan, and they knew the prowess of his arm. They had reached the foot of the steps when from far above there sounded a deep boom and another at another, and Turan smiled and breathed a sigh of relief. Perhaps, after all, it had not come too late. The warriors stopped and listened, as did the others in the chamber. Now there broke upon their ears a loud rattle of musketry, and it all came from above as though men were fighting upon the roofs of the palace. Where is it? they demanded one of the other. A great storm has broken over Manator, said one. Mind not the storm until you have slain the creature who dares stand upon the throne of your jeddak, demanded Otar. Seize him! 
Even as he ceased speaking, the arras behind the throne parted, and a warrior stepped forth upon the dais. An exclamation of surprise and dismay broke from the lips of the warriors of Otar. Uthor! they cried. What treason is this? It is no treason, said Utor in his deep voice. I bring you a new jeddak for all of Manator. No lying paltroon, but a courageous man whom you all love. He stepped aside, and another emerged from the corridor hidden by the arras. It was Acor, and at sight of him there rose exclamations of surprise, of pleasure, and of anger as the various factions recognized the coup d'etat that had been arranged so cunningly. Behind a corps came other warriors until the dais was crowded with them, all men of Manator from the city of Manatos. Otar was exhorting his warriors to attack when a bloody and disheveled padwar burst into the chamber through a side entrance. "'The city has fallen!' he cried aloud. The hordes of Manatos pour through the gate of enemies. The slaves from Gaithal have arisen and destroyed the palace guards. Great ships are landing warriors upon the palace roof and in the fields of Jitan. The men of Helium and Gaithal are marching through Manator. They cry aloud for the princess of Helium and swear to leave Manator a blazing funeral pyre consuming the bodies of all our people. The skies are black with ships. They come in great processions from the east and from the south. And then once more the doors from the Hall of Chiefs swung wide open, and the men of Manator turned to see another figure standing upon the threshold, a mighty figure of a man with white skin and black hair and gray eyes that glittered now like points of steel, and behind him the Hall of Chiefs was filled with fighting men wearing the harness of far countries. Tara of Helium saw him, and her heart leaped in exultation, for it was John Carter, warlord of Barsoom, come at the head of a victorious host to the rescue of his daughter, and at his side was Dior Kantos, to whom she had been betrothed. The warlord eyed the assemblage for a moment before he spoke. "'Lay down your arms, men of Manator,' he said. "'I see my daughter, and that she lives, and if no harm has befallen her, no blood may be shed. Your city is filled with the fighting men of Uthor and those from Gaithal and from Helium. The palace is in the hands of the slaves from Gaithal beside a thousand of my own warriors who fill the halls and chambers surrounding this room. The fate of your jeddak lies in your own hands. I have no wish to interfere. I come only for my daughter and to free the slaves from Gaithal. I have spoken, and without waiting for a reply, and as though the room had been filled with his own people rather than a hostile band, he strode up the broad main aisle toward Tara of Helium. The chiefs of Manator were stunned. They looked to Otar, but he could only gaze helplessly about him as the enemy entered from the Hall of Chiefs and circled the throne room until they had surrounded the entire company, and then a dwar of the army of Helium entered. "'We have captured three chiefs,' he reported to the warlord who begged that they be permitted to enter the throne room and report to their fellows some matter which they say will decide the fate of Manator. Fetch them, ordered the warlord. They came, heavily guarded, to the foot of the steps leading to the throne, and there they stopped, and the leader turned toward the others of Manator, and raising high his right hand displayed a jeweled dagger. We found it, he said, even where Igos said that we would find it, and he looked menacingly upon Otar. Acor, Jeddak of Manator, cried a voice, and the cry was taken up by a hundred hoarse-throated warriors. There can be but one Jeddak in Manator, said the chief who held the dagger, his eyes still fixed 
upon the hapless otar he crossed to where the latter stood and holding the dagger upon an outstretched palm proffered it to the discredited ruler there can be but one jeddak in manator he said meaningly otar took the proffered blade and drawing himself to his full height plunged it to the guard into his breast in that single act redeeming himself in the esteem of his people and winning an eternal place in the hall of chiefs as he fell all was silence in the great room to be broken presently by the voice of uthar o tar is dead he cried let akor rule until the chiefs of all manator may be summoned to choose a new jeddak what is your answer let akor rule akor jeddak of manator the cries filled the room and there was no dissenting voice Acor raised his sword for silence. It is the will of Acor, he said, and that of the great Jed of Manatos, and the commander of the fleet from Gathol, and of the illustrious John Carter, warlord of Barsoom, that peace lie upon the city of Manator, and so I decree that the men of Manator go forth and welcome the fighting men of these our allies as guests and friends and show them the wonders of our ancient city and the hospitality of manator i have spoken and uthor and john carter dismissed their warriors and bade them accept the hospitality of manator as the room emptied dior kantos reached the side of tara of helium the girl's happiness at rescue had been blighted by sight of this man whom her virtuous heart told her she had wronged. She dreaded the ordeal that lay before her, and the dishonor that she must admit before she could hope to be freed from the understanding that had for long existed between them. And now Dior Kantos approached, and kneeling, raised her fingers to his lips. "'Beautiful daughter of Helium,' he said, "'how may I tell you the thing that I must tell you, "'of the dishonor that I have all unwittingly done you? "'I can but throw myself upon your generosity for forgiveness. "'But if you demand it, I can receive the dagger "'as honorably as did Otar.' "'What do you mean?' asked Tara of Helium. What are you talking about? Why speak thus in riddles to one whose heart is already breaking? Her heart already breaking? The outlook was anything but promising, and the young Padwar wished that he had died before ever he had had to speak the words he must now speak. Tara of Helium, he continued, we all thought you dead. For a long year have you been gone from Helium. I mourned you truly, and then, less than a moon since, I wed with Olvia Marthus. He stopped, and looked at her with eyes that might have said, Now strike me dead. Oh, foolish man, cried Tara, nothing you could have done could have pleased me more. Dio or Kantos, I could kiss you. I do not think that Olvia Marthus would mind he said, his face now wreathed with smiles. As they spoke, a body of men had entered the throne room and approached the dais. They were tall men, trapped in plain harness, absolutely without ornamentation. Just as their leader reached the dais, Tara had turned to Gahan, motioning him to join them. Diorakantos, she said, I bring you Turan the Panthon, whose loyalty and bravery have won my love. John Carter and the leader of the new-come warriors who were standing near looked quickly at the little group. The former smiled an inscrutable smile. The latter addressed the Princess of Helium. Turon the Panthon, he cried, know you not, fair daughter of Helium, that this man you call Panthon is Gahan, Jed of Gathol? 
For just a moment Tara of Helium looked her surprise, and then she shrugged her beautiful shoulders as she turned her head to cast her eyes over one of them at Gahan of Gathol. Jed or Panthon, she said, what difference does it make what one's slave has been? And she laughed roguishly into the smiling face of her lover. His story finished, John Carter rose from the chair opposite me, stretching his giant frame like some great forest-bred lion. "'You must go?' I cried, for I hated to see him leave, and it seemed that he had been with me but a moment. "'The sky is already red beyond those beautiful hills of yours,' he replied, "'and it will soon be day. "'Just one more question before you go,' I begged. "'Well?' he assented good-naturedly. "'How was Gahan able to enter the throne room garbed in Otar's trappings?' I asked. "'It was simple, for Gahan of Gathol,' replied the warlord. With the assistance of Igos, he crept into the Hall of Chiefs before the ceremony, while the throne room and Hall of Chiefs were vacated to receive the bride. He came from the pits, through the corridor that opened behind the arras at the rear of the throne, and passing into the Hall of Chiefs, took his place upon the back of a riderless thoat, whose warrior was in Igos' repair room. When Otar entered, and came near him, Gahan fell upon him and struck him with the butt of a heavy spear. He thought that he had killed him, and was surprised when Otar appeared to denounce him. And Gek! What became of Ghek? I insisted. After leading Baldor and Floron to Tara's disabled flyer, which they repaired, he accompanied them to Gathol, from where a message was sent to me in Helium. He then led a large party, including Acor and Uthor, from the roof, where our ships landed them, down a spiral runway into the palace, and guided them to the throne room. We took him back to Helium with us, where he still lives, with his single Rykor, which we found all but starved to death in the pits of Manator. But come, no more questions now. I accompanied him to the East Arcade, where the red dawn was glowing beyond the arches. Goodbye, he said. I can scarce believe that it is really you, I exclaimed. Tomorrow I will be sure that I have dreamed all this. He laughed and drawing his sword scratched a rude cross upon the concrete of one of the arches. "'If you are in doubt tomorrow, he said, "'come and see if you dream this.' A moment later he was gone. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars. Recording by Tom Weiss.